This is the Tabernacle Podcast with John Vermilia and me, Britton Bishop. What's up, John? What's up is it feels like we haven't been down here in a while. I but I know that's not true. We do this every week. I think, yeah, we do do this every week. Maybe we missed that one week. Well, we were in North Carolina, so then that felt like we've been oh, gone that was, forever. That well, was a good time. Good week. Saw good time. Charles Spurgeon sermon notes. You did not. I did not see that. I was already gone. I tried to get Chris Ember to national treasure them with me, but he wouldn't go back. Oh, dude, if you'd have brought home a original Charles Spurgeon sermon notes behind glass, I mean, the Shekinah glory, <laughs> we couldn't. For those of you who don't know, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. He's called the Prince of Preachers. He's from back in the day. 1859, <laughs> Metropolitan Tabernacle. Yeah. We were in North Carolina. Uh, we got invited um, to uh, be a part of a Billy Graham evangelism intensive. We both have certificates. Well, I have my certificate. I, you lost yours already. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, I lost it. That's a good word. Yeah, you I lost it. I didn't leave it laying in the hotel. Yeah, you I lost it. Pack it but yeah. No offense, Billy Graham. Uh, you don't need the paper. People. I will say. He um, signed it. Dr. Don Wilton. He was outstanding. Yeah. Billy Graham's pastor. Dude, that was awesome. That was all. I feel he like spoke to us. In yeah. my experience being around here, every time we travel and go places, at least it seems like way, anytime somebody's speaking with another accent, it's always better. <laughs> it's always better. <laughs> Alistair Begg, John Woodhouse, Don Dr. Don Wilton. Wilton. He's, he's like, you know where he's from? He's from South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> he said it. Man, and these guys can South say whatever Africa. they want. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But I would add to that. Um, and this, uh, you know, for. For our Tab family, for the listeners, we take it very seriously what we do. And so anytime we can be trained by others Mm -hmm. to get better at preaching, teaching God's word, pastoral ministry. And what was so powerful, at least for me, was this Don Wilton, who was Billy Graham's pastor for the last 25 years of his life. He was the first address. He was speaking to preachers. Mm Mm-hmm. And he was not pulling punches. No. I mean, there was, remember that time when he was just staring people down? Yeah. I mean, it was like, you felt it. Oh, 100%. You felt it in the room, man. Yeah, he was. And, and I was like, preach more. Yeah. Preach more. Oh, 100%. I, I think about like the nerves that you would have stepping onto the platform to preach with Billy Graham sitting there. But like, you could just tell that was a dude that was called by God, not by any man. And he was going to preach what God told him to. And he didn't, wasn't really concerned about with who was in the room. Not even and a little bit. it was clear. But yeah. he was, he was an awesome dude. Got to interact with him a little bit in between sessions and stuff. Solid yeah. dude. I want to find more of his stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think he's on the radio. Is he? I think it's, uh, it might be the Enduring Word okay. radio show, or he, he was, he's now retired. He was, pa- he was pastor of First Baptist Spartanburg. And in case you're out there going, wait a minute, Billy Graham died. Yes, Billy Graham is dead. Yes. He, we watched a video of yeah. Billy Graham speaking to us, but Don Wilton was there um, just speaking to us and relating stories mm-hmm. of his time pastoring Mr. Graham, Mr. which Graham. they all refer to him as Mr. 111 Mr. times. 111 Mr. Graham. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They don't talk, they don't call him Billy. No. Well, you know, I don't know first name basis here, yeah. okay? This is, this is a man who made it to the finish line, yeah. you know, without a scandal. Yeah. And uh, um, one thing, and you and I didn't even have a chance to talk about this, mm. but since our podcast, we can do whatever we want. Absolutely. We're going to talk about it right now. I thought it was interesting, and I won't share the whole story, but Don Wilton shared one time, because in the later years of, of Mr. Graham's life, he would travel up to his house, which mm-hmm. was almost an hour away, yeah. and he would spend Saturdays with him. In fact, I think he wrote a book called um, Saturdays with Billy, because uh, he would just go up because Billy Graham was no longer able mm-hmm. to get down there. He could only listen or watch online, and so he, he, he spent time with him. And in one of those times... As he was leaving, Billy Graham looks at his pastor, Don Wilton, and says, do you know Jesus, Don? Like he went there with him. Mm. And he was like, yes, I know him. And he knows me. I know his voice. And I, w- I was just like, now, if you're in the Tab family and you start coming up, if, I don't need <laughs> I a, a thousand Tab people coming up to me on the weekend. John, do you know Jesus? It's like, I think I know Jesus, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I don't One know. time I was preaching in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, trying to raise support as this new itinerant missionary going to Sri Lanka, all this stuff. It's like a congregation of like four people. If you're listening to this, shout out. Shout out. They were all related. Yeah. And I show up, I go into this little tiny church and I do my presentation, preach. And at the end, I'm like, all right, anybody have any questions? So I'm standing in front of this congregation and this guy goes, I, I really like what you had to say. 
But I'm just wondering, have you had that moment of salvation? <laughs> like, man, that's, a, that's how you know you killed it as a preacher when people are questioning your, your salvation. salvation. <laughs> oh, I love so it. been there. I love it. No, I think the 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 biggest thing I took away was the fact that as we were walking through and they had all the exhibits and all that stuff. And I sent you a picture of this and they had one of his preaching Bibles and it said one of Billy Graham's preaching Bible. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. And so what I learned the most was it is okay to have more than one preaching Bible. So Hope, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just trying to be like the ones that have done it before me. Uh, so oh. if I have more than one preaching Bible, Hope. How many you got? One, two, one, three. Two. No, how many preaching Bibles you got? That I actually preach from? Yeah. Four. Same here. Same yep. here. I have my ESV. I have two ESVs. What's your next one? I have ESB, two CSBs, and then I have an NIV. All right. I've, I've got two ESVs, one I use on the road, mm-hmm. one of them I use here uh, just because of size. Yep. And then I have the CSB that you gave me, thank you, and you wrote in it, and I love that Bible. Um, and if the text is better served or more accurate in the CSB, I'll use that Most even here or on the road. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not all the time. Um, and then I have an NLT. Okay, yeah. That I use to go through Romans with. Yeah. And uh, I want a good NLT. I just want. Yeah, they they're not quality. Skyler just made one. But... Sorry, clarification. NLT the translation is quality. Yes. You and I like goat skin. We're nerds. Yeah. It's the guy that's like, yeah. I got this drill, this drill, and this drill. Why? I don't know. It's because it's our tools, man. <laughs> yeah. Got to. So, I mean, most much... you just most of you don't even know where your Bible is. So don't get in my face about how many I have. <laughs> just find yours. <laughs> And in your in my case, we don't even know where our tools are. Oh, 100%. I don't know Dude, where that drill I'm, went. Somebody asked hey, me. Hey, Benji, will you clean up this workbench? I watched Matt Hughes put these little things in so we can hang lights from them. And I watched him drill or whatever it's called, oh, put one screw in. He's pro. And I was like, I would have put three holes in the drywall. <laughs> I would have lost my been, salvation it twice. It been hanging. And it wouldn't be up there. <laughs> He's using tools I've never seen before. He's and a pro. I'll ne- Hope's like, hey, can you do this? And I'm like. No. Do you know how much anxiety you're about to cause me? Oh, dude, I'm I'm te- I'm so if I didn't have Seth Bush in my life to call and he knows and he's teaching me, he's taking me through the like our couch broke. And I'm like, bro, I don't know how to fix this. So he comes over, brings all his stuff, but it's literally like I'm a ten year old. He's like, I'm the same. Right, now you just cut it like this, and you're gonna put it here. And then now Seth just comes over to the point where he's like, I'm just gonna knock this out, bro. I'll just knock like, this appreciate out. Appreciate you. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, man. So hope's much more I capable feel your than pain. I am in that space. I feel your pain. I'm just further down the road. I've I've, I've used a lot of nails and a lot of screws. <laughs> There's a lot of Johnny rigging around oh, my house. A hundred percent. Don't but, look at those angles. I did build the Mac Daddy outdoor table for my wife. There it is. And it's not perfect. It's, well, sorry. <laughs> I just took credit for that. My son, Benjamin, and I built that. Shout out, Benjamin. He put Miller. as many hours into that as I did. He he seems like he's got it figured out a little bit more than oh, either one 100%. of us. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. I think it's a spiritual gift. Shout out the guys that are good at it. Um, I'm not. And here's the thing. I think the issue is I don't care about being good at it. Mm-mm. It's like I, I could probably get better. <sighs> I'm good. I'm good. I like the excuse. (laughs) I hope she doesn't listen to this episode. What are we doing Uh, today, bro? We are jumping in back into our first John, um, just kind of series. I think we're finding that as we're doing these one-offs, like we just released an episode not too long ago, a change life story with Tim Manzer. Oh, love that guy. Um, It's kind of became like those, that one combined with our grief episode. So hopefully that serves uh, the podcast family in a really cool way. My favorite quote from that episode, I went back and listened to it today and I saw I was driving from Manistee to here, and he said something in it that I heard the first time, but I heard it again, and it was so, so good. And I just want to remind our church, um, our Tabernacle podcast family, whoever's listening to these that's out there, he made a statement that I think is profound in the life of somebody trying to follow Jesus for a long time. And it was, Lord, it was a prayer he says often, Lord, don't waste my pain. Mm. And I just loved that perspective. And I think that if we, so many people, the pain in their life becomes the shaking the fist and things like that. But just hearing that reminder, I think as I was driving across the mountain today was, was what I needed. So yeah. And I don't often go back and listen to the podcast, but when it's guys like Tim Manzer, or if we'll have some special guests on yeah, here. I want to hear their yeah. voices. So yeah. it was really no, good. No, that's good. Uh, because pain's part of this life. Jesus yeah. promised it. He said, in this life, you will suffer. Yep. In this life, it's going to be hard. Um, and that wasn't just for Peter in John 21. He yeah. said it to his disciples. Um, but God can use it yep. if you let him. Mm-hmm. Some people just, you know, I know I have just sat in pain before yeah. and just kind of 
wallowed yeah. instead of, hey, God, how do you want to use this? So yeah, That's good. Good work. So we're jumping in back to First John. It's kind of our filler episodes as we continue having new guests on, different things like that. Looking forward to some episodes to come in the future. Um, we're creeping up on episode 100 with a very special guest mm. that will not be named until yeah. episode 100. There you go. You have to check it out. He has a special guest. He is not from Michigan. Will there be cake? Probably not, but probably get, not. I bet I could find some. We don't need cake, but you know what we do need is probably pie. Yeah. Episode 100. Pie. What would be really good is some jerky that never shows up. (laughs) I don't know if there's any listeners that, you know, work with jerky. They're jerks that work with jerky, but. Uh, Ben Yost is going with us on the Foundry um, outreach mission trip, and I'm really hoping he brings jerky for the road trip. That's awesome. He's going, man. Yeah, I'm pumped. He's going to security? Yeah. 100%. 100%. Just to make sure Benji doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben Yost uh, is riding hurt on Benji so he yes. doesn't hurt anybody. So no. he doesn't roundhouse kick somebody. <laughs> yeah. Love it. So and we'll, we're not talking about the people you're ministering to. No, it'll we're be someone the kids on in the, the van with on, Benji. <laughs> there might be someone. <laughs> karate chop. <chocolate. laughs> <Yes. laughs> I love it. No, I'm excited. Uh, so we're in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. I'll read 7 through 11. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. That was good. Was that, was that out of the CSV? Yeah. Yeah. The, the way it begins in the ESV, and I think the NIV as well, it begins, John calls them uh, beloved. Right? I think that yeah. was my dear friends. Yep. And, and it, it communicates the same thing. But, I mean, you really see this pastor's heart, and the context is... Everything he said in the first chapter and in the first part of two uh, is about love. It's, it's just all about love. And so when he says, and there, I think there's a little um, play on words here. Um, it, it says, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment. And you're said, I am not writing you a new commandment, yep. right? Um, Jesus at the Last Supper said, a new command I give you, mm. that you love one another. And so now John is saying, this isn't new. This right. is the foundation, the basis yeah. for all of our faith. God is love. In him, there is no darkness mm-hmm. at all. And so we too are to be people that love. Yeah. And love is a risky business. It's hard. Yeah. It's difficult. Um, you know, we've, we've talked before about the difference between loving people and liking people. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people I don't like, right. but God says I have to love them. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's people that I like and love. Um, but he says, this is, this is an old commandment that you had from the beginning. And, and what he's reminding us is the beginning of faith. Hmm. Uh, if you go all the way back to uh, um, the Old Testament, though, it's always been a part of the program. Hmm. You know, uh, the Shema, you know, yeah. you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. And Jesus said, and the second is like unto it, you will love your neighbor yeah. as yourself. So he's reminding them again that it's all about love. Yeah, I love the study note I have here. It says, the love command was intensified and perfected in its expression by Jesus. Yes. Yet it is old, rooted in God's love and his commands in the Old Testament. And then it points to a couple of cross-references. But you hit on something that I think is a good bunny trail to start. And it's that thing that love is difficult. Um, it's not easy. It's not something that necessarily comes naturally to a lot of people. And so um, I think it'd be good for us to spend just a little time journeying kind of in that space of like what love, what does it look like for us as believers today to love everyone like we love to love our neighbors, we love ourselves. Because here at the Tabernacle, we believe we're to love God mm-hmm. and to love people. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the, there's key words in both of those statements and it's the key word is love. Right. And so I think for us to to spend some time maybe digging into what is love and how does that unfold in the life of a believer. So yeah. I guess for one, yeah. and I yeah. know it's not it's not an easily defined word, but how would you kind of express like in this context yeah. with that stuff what? Well, I think it's helpful. Um I mean if we skip the part where he's talking about darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. 
But he spells it out starting in verse 9. He says, whoever says he's in the light, hmm. so that means I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus, I love God, and I love people. But if you hate your brother, you're still in darkness. Yeah. And when I hear that, it, he, he puts it in st- like stark, or he uses stark language there, if you hate your brother. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people in church, a lot of people call themselves Christians, a lot of people in a marriage or in, in a family that'll say, well, I don't hate that person, but... I would come back and say, well, you don't exactly love them either. Right. And so maybe you don't define it as hate, but think about, think about the grudges we carry against people mm-hmm. or when someone says something that hurts you and then you just avoid that person. That's hating your brother mm-hmm. when you don't go to your brother because your brother or sister may not know that they hurt you. Mm-hmm. Um, the way we talk to our children can feel like hate. The way we talk to our parents can feel like hate. Um, the way we let people annoy us, it, 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 like whenever we don't give this person a break for they're doing the best with the tools that they have, and we choose to kind of hold that part of actively loving them, you know, whenever it turns into resentment, whenever it turns into avoidance, oh, here's a hard one, whenever it's unforgiveness, mm. you know, then there's so many people that think forgiveness is... Um, saying that whatever offended you is okay. No, it doesn't make what they did okay. Right. But forgiveness is choosing to release them from that. Yeah. So I think love is related to forgiveness. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that'll say, well, you know, this hor- horrible thing happened in my childhood and I just can't get past it. And this person's no longer in their life. And I'm like, well, you need to forgive them. And in their mind, they got to go find that person who abused yeah. that person who... Uh, said something awful, that person who abandoned or whatever, and then go, I forgive you. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is reserving my right to hold something over Mm -hmm. you, um, uh, letting go of that. Say, you know what? That judgment, that retribution, that vengeance, that's God's. Mm -hmm. That's not mine. I release you from that. Mm -hmm. And you may never have a conversation. Yeah. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because I think, you know, we're talking about love and walking in the light, but I think that that's the practical loving people yeah. is, you know, so when it says you will love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, there's some weird, uh, and, and that's the great commandment. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes we can turn that into uh, a 20, you know, 23 self-help. Oh, you need right. to love yourself. Right. Love yourself. You can't love others until you love yourself. Love yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, you no, know, love the way you would want to be loved mm-hmm. is I think is what yeah. he's trying to say. And love the way God has loved you. And how many times have I abused God's grace? Yep. Have I abandoned God? Have I desert with my actions or mm-hmm. my thoughts or whatever? You no, know, that's so. good. And I think you're pointing to something too, because in that fact of loving um, that you're hitting on bitterness and the Bitter, unforgiveness, yes. bitterness, I think is the biggest hindrance all of us have in our ability to love the people around us. And sometimes it's a, it's a bitterness that that person hasn't even necessarily brought upon themselves. It's through our own lens by which we view them or the, or the person that we're associating with or a person we're associating them with or the group we're associating them with. And I see that even in some of the communities that we get to be a part of and some of the stuff like that. I, this might be controversial, but there's um, an organization that is in Manistee and they're – honestly, they serve the crap out of our community. But the thing that they do, we don't agree with as a church. Um, we don't think it's a, it's an okay thing. Um, but the people behind it we find are – man, you know what? They'll hang up our posters when we ask them to at this, at this business. Mm-hmm. Um, they're some of the nicest people that I've inter- interacted with in our whole entire community. But the way the people of our church – Talk about these individuals yeah. because of the business they're associated with. Yeah. And it's just like, that's not it, guys. That's not loving your neighbor. And I think that, but there's that piece within it where it's like, all right, so if that's how you feel about them, survey says. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, right. John's talking about yeah. it. You're talking with resentment, with bitterness, yep. with hatred. You know, they don't. They don't abide by the same rules. Like, right. I think I know the business you're talking right. about. and It's and, a pot shop. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And they are the sweetest people on the planet. And I don't agree with what they're doing. Um, necessarily. You're not condoning. No, you're not I don't telling condone. People to, I don't yeah. think everybody but should. But if they're going to hang our stuff. Yeah. They hang up our posters and they're, and we love what you're doing for our community. She tells wow. me that every time I go to ask her to hang up a poster. And it's like, okay, like, cool. We've got something between us. 
where we probably won't have the greatest relationships, but you see me and I see you and you're a person and I'm a person. But I think even just like that beginning aspect of being a domino in those people's lives is the fact that like, oh, there's a church that'll walk in here and talk to us, not just be at the city planning meetings and try to get rid of us. Like, and I don't disagree with that aspect of it. Like, and I think she knows that deep down, Yeah. but the fact that I'm willing to look her in the eyes and be nice, yeah, be respectful. And I think that as a, I think there's just a big piece of that that Christians are missing in their life is it's just like, if I don't agree with that person, then I can't associate whatsoever. Yeah. And there's the whole um, Derek Carr. Um, I remember when he, all the stuff was going down with his head coach and all that stuff. Quarterback. Quarterback. For, was for the Raiders. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they asked, well, how Christian. are you going to, how are you yeah. going to handle this? And he goes, man, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to love the center, not the sin. Oh, I remember that. I yeah. don't condone what that guy did. Um, actually, I think it's really bad. But I know that my call is to love him. That's and what so, love looks like. Yeah. That's what love looks like. Yeah. It, instead of cancel mm-hmm. culture, you yeah. know, Christians talk about culture all the time. And, oh, man, if you say this, you say that, you know, you're going to get canceled. Mm-hmm. And, and But Christians do it too. Yeah. We have our own – I mean – Cancel culture started in the church, yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, you go all the way back to the New Testament, and it started between Jews and Gentiles. Mm-hmm. The Jews are like, who are these Gentiles coming in here? We're God's chosen. We're God's people. We're God's whatever. And then, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit and Paul had to shake some people. Yeah. One of them was Peter. Yeah. You know, hey, Peter, why do you act one way around Gentiles and a different way around Jews? That's a key piece you're hitting Nailed on. him, right? Yeah. And then they get together and it says the gospel's for everyone. It goes all the way back to Abraham when God told him, I'm going to bless all nations through your offspring. One of those offsprings was Jesus. Yeah. And, and it, now his offspring are spiritual offspring mm-hmm. and it's open to Jews and Gentiles. Yeah. But it goes on and on. Different color, you know. Uh, so it started within the church, and now we've gotten really good at people outside the church. Mm-hmm. I've said it before, and um, I, I don't think we should hide it. There was a period of time when the tabernacle, this was way before uh, you and I ever even were part of this. Yeah. Um, what almost killed this church is this church was more known for what they were against than what they were for. Mm. And a lot of Christians are known more for what they're against than what they're for, Yeah. right? That almost killed this church. Mm-hmm. And so you said something when you said that bitterness or yeah. what I'd call resentment yeah. or, or just disassociation or yeah. whatever it is. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus let the worst, the worst into his circle of friendship. Yeah. And it's who's going to influence who. He let a woman of ill repute wash his feet. Yeah. anoint his feet, dry his feet with her hair, which yeah. was scandalous. He never did any sin. Right. And in and, and, and there, oh, if he knew what kind of a woman this was, you know, uh, he wouldn't let her do it. Or he must not be a prophet. Yeah. And he called out their sin. And so I think that, you know, you were saying they're missing something. John spells it out. If that is your heart, you are walking in darkness. Yeah. He says it right there. There he says if you hate your brother you're still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother is in the light yeah. and in him there's no cause for stumbling. But if you hate your brother you're in the darkness, you walk in darkness and you don't know where you're going, you're blind. Yeah. No. You're and, blind. That's key. And I think too with what we're talking about here is um, Paul communicates this clearly in 1 Corinthians. I remember when we studied this where he talks about we can't hold people to a standard that they have not surrendered to. That's right. So for us to go into our communities or into our grocery stores or to go into the everyday places that we exist and to hold people to a standard of the gospel that they haven't surrendered to and then to resent them for not living by that standard is foolishness. Mm. That's not their standard of living. But whenever we're holding them to that standard and then hating them, resenting them, and not loving them the way Jesus is called to, what are we telling them about our standard of living? That's right. And I think that that's- What do we a, have that's different? Right. Yeah. And I think that's the key for Christians is to understand. Now, me and you, brothers, you're living outside of that standard. Matthew 18, we have a conversation. That's right. Then there can be a conversation, hey, man, what you're doing is wrong here. But I think for us as Christians, as we're looking to our communities and to the people that aren't necessarily- that aren't followers of Jesus, we have to learn that we lead with love in that space. Mm-hmm. 
Now, in the life of somebody that's a part of your church, in your fight club, in your tab women group you have community with that claims to be a follower of Jesus, yeah, lead with love, but it's okay to point out the sin in their life. That's right. But I think that that's where we kind of murky and get yeah. the waters mixed so, up. So that's related to judgment, right? Yeah. You'll hear people say things like, um, we're not supposed to judge. Uh, well, that's a Christian myth. That's a Christian myth. Hmm. We are supposed to judge, uh, but we only get to but we're not called to be judgmental. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't have the power, and no Christian has the power, <clears throat> to judge to the point of uh, your eternal destination. Mm-hmm. The, the Bible's very clear. People outside the church, we're not allowed to judge them yeah. because of what you just said. We've signed up for a different standard. Yeah. Christians in the church, we're called to make judgments, mm-hmm. not be judgmental, not decide whether they're Christian yeah. or not, but judge behavior. Am I going to follow this behavior? Or, you know, if I see that you're, or sorry, if you see that I'm stepping in it, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter that I'm 52 and you're 28, 27, 28, 27, 27. Uh, I've been a Christian forever. You've been a Christian for six years, seven years. Uh, It doesn't matter. You're called to judge. Hey, John, you know what? I I see a part of you that the church doesn't see. Mm -hmm. And Matthew 8, 18, you know, I need to confront you on this. And if I love you and I love God and I'm not a hypocrite, I welcome it. So either I can explain, oh, that's really not what you thought it was, or thank you. I I was in sin. Please forgive me. And I'm going to go set it straight with this person. So judge, we're... We're supposed to make judgments about how we live Mm. and in that whole accountability uh, piece, but uh, we're not called to judge people outside. Yeah, that's good. We don't get to – so I was just thinking about a practical example of this, and I I don't think I'll get in trouble for saying this. Um, There was one time, and you don't know if it was last week or last year (laughs) or 10 years ago, um, we – you know, someone just gave me a heads up that a dude that we don't know came to our church completely drunk he was trashed i mean like falling asleep level yeah. but somehow he came to church and uh, i don't know if he's trying to keep warm or what it was um and uh you know he took up a position in like the fourth row i know that some churches would have asked him to leave mm-hmm. but he wasn't he wasn't distracting anybody he wasn't disturbing anybody if you got up close to him, you knew you were drunk or he was drunk. But um, we just had an engagement dude just sat right behind him and, and was like, you know what? You know, I got eyes on him. But, um, you know, if there becomes a problem, we'll, you know, make sure that there's no distractions in the church. But this is probably the best place for him. Hmm. And that just made my heart happy. Yeah. Because, um, you know, we didn't draw a lot of attention to it. He was never a problem. I think uh, he might have fallen asleep during a message. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and maybe, you know, by the time the service was o- over, he was, you know, I, I don't think he drove there. We wouldn't have let right. him drive home, yeah. but um, maybe sobered up a little bit, yeah. you know, and hopefully he comes back yeah. rather than turn it. Now that's love. Mm-hmm. That's just a practical love yeah. thing. He Why didn't not? know any better, but he knew enough to be in church. Yeah. Cool. Maybe he had to drink a fifth because he was going to church for the first time. And he's right. like, I can't believe I'm doing this, you <laughs> right. know, and I need to take the edge off, you know. But we want to be a church like that. Right. Yeah. One of my favorite stories along that line at our Manistee campus, there was a um, time we're hanging out and one of the engagement guys comes up to me. Um, Seth was out of town and he goes, hey, somebody's sleeping in the loading dock. Because our loading dock's like perfectly placed, keep you out of the wind, keep you warm. So we go around there and there's a dude, set up camp, a homeless uh, homeless dude, and uh, he's sleeping, knocked out. And you get around and just smell, you can just smell the reekage of marijuana. You're like, man. So I look at our engagement guy, I won't name any names, this is what you think we should do. He goes, I don't know, what do you think we should do? I said, no, what do you think we should do? Because I knew what we were going to do. Yeah. And Bill goes, oh, dang it. You said his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the guys goes, yeah. let's go get him a cup of coffee. I'm like, all right. So we go get him a cup of coffee, bring it back. And I, it's like, hey, you go handle this. we got people showing up. So he goes around, he gives him the cup of coffee. Hey, you can't keep sleeping here, but you can come inside if you want. And the guy, I'll never forget, he came back two days later. He didn't go into church, but he came back two days later, and I've never seen so, sober as can be. And he said, man, I just want to tell you guys thank you. Mm. He's like, because I thought you were going to hate me. Really? And he goes, and I wanted you to. Mm. He said, but because of the way you treated me, it's got me thinking. That's awesome, man. And I was like, 
cool. And I didn't, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't me. It was uh, one of our individuals that is may or may not be on our engagement team, but, uh, that's awesome, man. <laughs> but it was just, that makes cool, me happy. Yeah. It was just yeah. a cool moment. So yeah, there's, there's good ways to do this, to, to love people. But, uh, I'm curious if yours, um, in verse 10, uh, the one who loves his brother, um, does, what's the word before in the light? It says abides. Yeah. Mine says remains. I think that that's a good one for us to hit on as well, because as we look at trying to continue to love people, um, there's a, there's, uh, there's a key to that is we have to love as we've been loved. And I, I don't know if we've hit on this. I'm assuming we have in first John because he says it all the time, but I think it's just a good reminder again, um, that as our good friend, Foster Christie says out of the overflow of your heart, out of your mouth comes the overflow of your heart. And so I think for us, if you're struggling with unforgiveness, bitterness, um, being judgmental, whatever that is, um, I, I would encourage you to take a look at maybe what Jesus has to say about you and your sin or how he'd speak to you in that space. But that word abide, remain, um, it's key because the more you know Jesus, the more you know how Jesus would interact in those places and with those people. Yeah. But yeah. Looks and like I'm, looks I'm, up. Yeah. I'm actually glad you brought that up because um, in John chapter 15, and this is another book that the same author wrote, yep. he recounts what Jesus did. And I, I think one reason he chose that word in the ESV abide or in the CSB remain, yeah. uh, which is a similar word. Yep. Um, abide sounds more spiritual. Right. It's I I probably have never heard abide in any context outside of the Bible, yep, and that's, <laughs> or 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 church yep. or a hymn, you know. Um, but uh, in John fifteen, this is his teaching um, at the Last Supper when he says, "I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes that you may bear fruit." And then he goes down in verse four, he says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So then he goes on, and I know this is a long passage, but this is Jesus talking, so where are you going to cut it off, right? Absolutely. He goes, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So this eternal love that is in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father eternally loving the Son, the Son receiving that love and loving his Father back— the Holy Spirit, the vehicle of the love between those two, that overflows to us. That overflows to the Christian. And so he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full, or I think some said that your joy may be complete. Yeah, and that connects back to First John chapter 1 when he talks about um, – it's all tying together, right? It's crazy how the Bible does that. Um, in First John chapter 1, at the conclusion of his kind of his intro, he says, um, What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Same thing. Yeah. Same words. Uh, here, here he goes on. This is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. So this abiding has to do with love. And that is, that is how we walk in the light, mm -hmm. to use the metaphor of 1 John. Yeah. That's how we abide in Christ. That's how we remain connected to the mm -hmm. branch. And so if your life isn't loving, and love is a choice, yeah. love is a choice, love is not a feeling. We got to remind yeah. people that all the time. 100%. But those people are mean to me. Those people, you know, it, man, if you're an eighth grade girl, you know, right now, yeah. there are mean girls in eighth grade. Right. Uh, sorry, there are mean girls in 80th years <laughs> old grade, right? right? <laughs> um, but loving is hard. It's yeah. hard to love people. And, and, um, and it's a command, mm -hmm. and it's a choice. It's not a feeling. Yeah. But when you choose to love people, even when it's difficult, you know, um, that's how we stay connected to them. Yeah, that's good. I love that. 
and then he closes kind of that that thing out. And I, there's there's a long bunny trail I see at the end here. Yeah. Uh, in verse 11. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, just like we've talked about, walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And I think that that is a place that we could camp out for a long time. But just that aspect of, and we've talked about it before on the podcast with different guests and different things, but that last statement of has blind his, the darkness has blinded his eyes. And how many people don't realize that the habitual sin that mm. is continuing to surface in their life, you just become numb to it. Yeah. And then it just becomes the default state of your existence. So he's pointing to the fact that if you remain in Christ, if you continue loving even the difficult people, walking in the light will continue. It will... It's never easy, but it gets easier because yeah. you have more practice in that space. But he also points to the fact that if you continue to walk in the darkness, if you continue to say no to Jesus and say yes to yourself, because at the end of the day, that's essentially what you're doing. Um, you won't even probably know. You're obviously you're not going to know where you're going because you're going to be blind to the fact that what you're even doing at this point. That's right. And I think that that's somewhere we could talk about for a long time. It's just the impact of sin yeah. in the life of people trying to follow Jesus. Yeah. And so I think walking in darkness, I, 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 I'm not overgeneralizing by saying he's just talking about living in sin. Yeah. Right. Is that an yeah. overgeneralization? Yeah. And, and, and the rest of this person's life might look like Christian. Yeah. Oh, that guy looks Christian. That guy acts Christian. He talks Christian, but there's this one thing that he's just hanging on and he's gotten so used to it. Mm. Um, I've, I've hundred percent been there. Yeah. hundred percent been there. And then, you know, sometimes it takes a moment to go, wait a minute. Mm. It could be in a sermon. It could be something I'm listening to. It could be a friend. It could be my wife that's like, you know what? This isn't right. Mm. And uh, the beautiful thing is, is when we let those things go, that first taste of sight is like, oh, mm. it's awesome. Now, it's easy to get hungry and start chasing yeah. that darkness again. But I liked how you said, there's so many times we can get so used to our sin that we just get okay with our sin. And then when we're used to it and we're okay with it, after a while, we don't even see it. Right. That's the blindness. 100%. That sets in. Mm -hmm. And it haunts me sometimes when I think about, or, you know, you read stories of, of uh, you know, for us, of pastors who fall, you know, and, and it's so weird. We call it you know, yeah, he fell. No, he didn't fall. There he was a jumped. he <laughs> jumped, but there was a long yeah. journey down that right. slippery slope. He climbed it's, up that yeah, ladder. Yeah, it's something that he justified. It's something that he got used to. That's something then he couldn't let go of, and then eventually it just blows yeah. up. And then it's another reason, like you know, the the friend that or the person that you were telling, you know, said, "Man, I wanted to not like you." Yeah. Because they start believing we're all hypocrites. Yep. Well, it's for all of us. Yeah is this choice to walk in the light. And um, those, those little decisions along the way where we choose darkness or choose light. Yeah. So just a couple of weeks ago, I referenced this passage and, and we were talking about walking in the light. Yeah. And uh, I think it was in the I Am series when mm -hmm. we were talking about I am the light of the world. Um, you know, I don't journal a ton, but we were going to this thing and I was going to take a lot of notes. And the very first thing I wrote on there was walk in the light. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that there was going to be some conversations with some people that um, would, were going to be difficult ones. And um, there's a little lawyer who lives in me, <laughs> and he's good. Yeah. He is, I will not lose as a trial attorney. That's an alternate <laughs> life for me. Yeah. Not, a, not a real estate attorney, right. not some, you know, be, be a team of attorneys. Right. I, there's an attorney in me that could stand before the judge and jury, and I will get the conviction. Yeah. Right. And I just wrote, walk in the light, mm. walk in the light. And I think it's related to meekness mm. is, is What's that? meek. Meek is um, strength mm -hmm. under guard yeah. or under, uh, or that, that is checked, yep. that is channeled, you know. Meek, That's why my favorite animal is the American bison. Oh, yeah. Why so, is that? I think they're just very meek creatures. Whenever you look at them, they're just grazing in the field. But then you tune into Animal Fight Night on Amazon <laughs> or whatever, and you watch them fight each other. Uh, you're like, I did not think that was going to come out of that thing. So I think, yeah, yeah just it's a cool picture. Of that. So meek meek would be um, <coughs> if uh, we were, you and I were in a confrontation. Mm -hmm. You could destroy me. You could, I mean, if, if we go, I mean, I may be able to outrun you. Right. But... Um, uh, I, but I don't know, you, you're pretty quick and you're half my age. <laughs> but if we were to go toe to toe, you choosing not 
right. to destroy me. That's meekness. And if, if Christians would, but love or abiding in this light and, and not hating your brother, it's if the motivation mm. for the meekness is love. I'm going to choose not to destroy this person. I could destroy this person with one argument, with one word, with one throat punch, but I'm not going to. Mm-hmm. I'm going to choose to. Jesus was meek. So yes. meek ain't weak. No. Meek is not weak. Jesus was meek when he allowed them mm. to crucify him. He allowed, you know, he could have called, as we've said before and heard countless preachers say, 10,000 angels uh, to just lay waste yeah. to that uh, trial, to the one who was scourging yeah. him with the cat of nine tails, to those who nailed him on the cross, who mocked and spit. Yeah. He, could have, he could have done it himself, yep. but he chose not to. That's meek. Yeah, that's and why that's I love, love. Even whenever we're, I remember, I think I was hearing you describe to somebody sometime, one time whenever we were talking about uh, communion and not using the word his body broken. No, he gave he his gave. body. Yeah. Nobody broke Jesus. They didn't Jesus break didn't Jesus. break. Yeah. One, it affirms all the prophecy beforehand, but two, I think just that word picture that no, he gave. Yeah. He gave his life. But no, uh, you're you're on a good path here with this idea of walking in the light. But I, I'm curious for the people listening that are maybe they have an area in their life where there is darkness or there is sin, there is something that is continually pulling them out of the light. What would be some steps or some practical ways that it, we could recommend just in your experience or our experience or whatever it is that they can continue battling with that pull to walk in the darkness so that they cannot be blinded, but that they can continue to be exposing that stuff to light. So what would be some practical things for people listening? Well, so we're talking about repentance. Hmm. And the first step in repent, or repentance, I think, is the turning from that sin. And it's a choice yeah. that says, I am I am choosing to repent and turn from this sin. I'm turning from darkness to the light. And so what's involved with that, I think, is confession. Hmm. It says in the book of James that we're to confess our sins one to another so that we can be healed. Yeah. And some of that is uh, shining light on our sin. You know, I, I, I had a good friend, he's a mutual friend that um, uh, uh, shared, I don't wanna say his name, but we, we, were, we were at a place together and um, we were sharing a hotel room together. And um, he was in the hotel room and I was out later uh, at this function mm-hmm. or something. And when I got back to the hotel, room uh, at this conference, he was already asleep. Next morning, we're going to breakfast. And uh, he said to me, he goes, hey, man, I need to tell you something. He goes, "Um, last night, there was something inappropriate on one of the movie channels. And at first, I I flicked past it. Um, But then I went back there. And and it was something sexual, Mm -hmm. you know. And he goes, then I just cut off the television. What am I doing? And I went to bed. And he said, but, but I need to tell somebody. Mm. He goes, I need to tell you um, uh, just yeah. because I need to shine a light on my sin. You don't have to do nothing. I just want to let you know. Mm-hmm. And um, he taught me something there. He didn't have to tell me. I would have never known. Mm. He could have stayed in the darkness. But here's a trusted brother that he needed to confess. He'd already confessed his sin to God. God, please yep. forgive me for that. I, I, don't, I don't need to be yep. flicking back on you know, channels that I don't need to be on. Mm-hmm. But he also confessed it to me. So he's shining light on the thing. And each one of those steps it wasn't for me, even though it taught me something, right. it was for him. Yeah. It was for him. So we went to a new level in our relationship. Um, but for him, it was the next step of walking the light. Yeah. So uh, in answer to your question, it's repentance. It's confessing to God. All of our sin is a sin against God first. But then we confess our sin one to another mm. uh, so we can help one another, so we can pray for one another. Uh, and then it's a steady growing in that direction. Yeah. So repentance isn't a one-time thing. Yep. I, I'm actually glad you brought this up because I'm reminded of what they called the church. I think it's uh, Romania. It was either Romania or uh, the old Czechoslovakia. Mm-hmm. The church actually... Um, during during the communist years, um, they, you know, they still had church, but it was kind of fake church. Mm. It was kind of state church. It was so that, you know when when the West came, they could say, "Look, we're of course we're in an atheist uh, country, but we still let these you know foolish people right. practice their faith or whatever." And so in the church, 
the church divided between real Christians and those that were really atheist Christians, if that's even possible. Right. You know, the people that just kind of kept up the vestiges of the cathedral and their priesthood and all this kind of stuff. And the real Christians, those that were like, no, God is real. Uh, Jesus really walked the earth and died for our sins, and he's the only way of salvation, and we mm-hmm. want to walk in the light. It was so interesting. They called themselves repenters. Mm-hmm. They were the repenting church, and they called themselves repenters. But, but I was sitting there thinking, why are they still repenters? It was more to it because they called the process of becoming more and more like Jesus, what we call sanctification, it was a continual repenting. Mm. And so to the person, that was a long story, yeah, I tell you, I love it. Is, is it's not just a one-time repenting. It's choosing to always turn from dark to light, to That's walk good. in the light, to abide, to love, to forgive, to confess sin, both to God and to one another. I think all of those come into play. Yeah. And so many people, they will never confess their sin to one another. Or if they do, they do it in generalities. Mm. You know, all he had to say is, hey, man, you know, I no." he described in detail what he did. You know, this was my sin. Yeah. I looked at something inappropriate on the television and I stayed there too long. Yeah. And uh, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And and I've already talked to God about it, but I just wanted you to know if it, that's from my heart. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, this guy's solid, man. I want to yeah. I, I want to be more like him. Yeah. You know, that's good. And I'm curious because, too, I think. Your response is important in that as well, because you have, as you continue to build that community aspect to this faith, where it's like, man, not not only are we confessing sin to one another, but somebody on the other end of that is receiving or hearing that confession. So what would you say to the individuals, maybe that that person is coming to them with trust, um, coming to them with vulnerability, coming to them with authenticity, and they're kind of laying that sin out there, what would be the proper um, response, po- res- posture, response to not to listening to that person or whatever that that may look like because i think that as well the people that struggle with confession is what's the fear majority of the time with confession that somebody would tell you why don't you confess your sin you're going to be judged for right. it yeah I, you're going to be thought less they're of they're going to think less of me they're going to judge me yeah and it's that fear that the enemy speaks into that but for the people that are trying if we're trying to build this authentic community of people that are chasing after Jesus and this is a key mm-hmm. aspect to it how can the listeners and the people of the church on the other end of that one we need to be actively being vulnerable and authentic with our sin and bringing that to people but two on the other end of that what would be kind of your wisdom to the people that are I hate the word receiving I don't know why but yeah. the, the people yeah. that are you're taking, hearing the confession hearing that yeah. confession yeah, yeah. Um, I think the first thing has been the theme of this whole episode is love yeah show them love speak love uh no don't say stupid things like oh that's okay that's no big deal no if it's a big deal and you feel convicted Mm. um yeah man uh have you confessed it to god Mm. good good then um you know i might say something if it's true Mm. you know i struggle with that too Mm. uh but thanks for sharing that and and then maybe pointing them Mm. to what scripture says hey you know you're forgiven for that you know you're still a child of god you know and it doesn't make it okay um, one, of, one of my favorite scriptures mm-hmm. is one I've probably prayed a thousand times yeah. is Psalm 51. Okay. The, one, the one that begins, this is David, um, uh, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he'd gone to Bathsheba. So he was rebuked yeah. and he was rebuked publicly for a very private affair yeah. and private sin. Um, but he wrote, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight so that you are justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And so this is the whole passage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is where he says in verse 7, purge me with hyssop, um, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within Mm me. So we start with love, we end with love. Uh, You know, I still love you. Uh, Another practical thing, if someone comes to you with that, that's not yours to tell. Mm. That's a gift. Yeah. That's a gift. Now, I know someone could say, well, you just told everybody. Yeah, I didn't tell you who. Right. I didn't tell you who. Right. Um, And so it becomes a gift. Um that uh, that I don't share with other people, yep. that now we've just moved to a deeper place in our relationship, yeah. or dare I say intimacy, yeah. you know, with another follower of Jesus trying to walk in the yeah. light, you know, 
many times when someone confesses sin to me, um, I'm convicted of my own sin. Hmm. That hmm. happens all the time. You know, I've, I've had people on our staff go, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that. You know, this person's doing the best with the tools that they have. And I've just been really judgy. Yeah. And I was like, I was laughing at your judgment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, that's <laughs> you, good. you know, so that's how it makes us all better. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a gift when someone comes yeah. to you that way. I think too, um, to answer my own question, which we do a lot on this podcast, um, right. is not trying to fix the individual in that moment. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. I should have said that. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that's one where so then they start feeling less than and all that. And it's like, no, let that be enough for right now. Trust the fact that Jesus is going to meet him in that, but also follow up is okay. Yeah. Um, saying, hey, man, I hear you. Um, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, you're forgiven. You know that through scripture. Yeah. Can we talk next week? Yeah. Or, and, and then maybe you come back yeah. with, you know, something that's helped me. I don't yeah. know if it'll help you, but this right. has helped me. But give it some time while yeah. the wound's still fresh. Right. Just put the bandage over it. Trust that Jesus is in that space. Yeah. Pray for him. Um, I think is important. James talks about that, the prayer of a righteous person. Um, and, and I think that, but also in time, building in those follow-ups and things like that, because that's how you see that con- that relationship continue to grow and continue to flourish is as you create those spaces. So yeah, I just think that that's something that with confession, one, it's important um, to have, for me, brothers, um, that's not a weight that I ask my wife to bear. Uh, there are times where her and I do have conversations or there's specific sin or something that she needs to know about or that we talk about or whatever it is. But I think it's important for dudes to have dudes and girls to have girls that they can go to to have those conversations. So like for me, I've got a group of guys that we do Monday check-in every week and we've got a monthly FaceTime where we all just talk and air it out, whether it be this is what's going on, so I'm struggling with it, whatever it might be. Um, but I think it's important for us to have um, – like for men to have men in their life and for women to have women in their life to be able to to have those conversations and, and spend that time uh, loving on one another because I think that's when we really start to see the body become the body. Yeah. Now this is, this might be controversial. Hmm. You know, I'm not afraid of that though. That is one thing that I can see why the Catholic tradition mm-hmm. has confession be a part of it. Yeah. Now, it, I just dialed up, got questions real quick on why James says that we should confess our sin to one another. And he says, here's, here's just a couple tidbits that might take us into overtime. It says, the word confess means to agree, to admit, or to say the same thing. Confession is saying the same thing as God does about sin or having the same perspective on sin as God does. It involves identifying sin for what it truly is, honestly acknowledging the offenses we've committed. Confession should also include an attitude of turning away from sin or repentance. So then he, he, or the article goes on to say that when you're struggling with sin, we're to seek faithful and trusted brothers and sisters in Christ who will intercede for us in our battle against sin, mm. not carelessly to anyone, but to mature believers. You just said that. Um, and then it says, confessing our sins to one another in the body of Christ can break the power of secret sin. Covering up sin has no profit, but yields negative consequences. And it says this, uh, um, when I refuse to confess my sin, this is David, um, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. That's Psalm 32. So if we're trying to live in the light of the truth, Confession is an essential part of the Christian life. It doesn't require a priest. Hmm. You know, that's where I deviate from the controversy, you know, where, you know, a priest says, oh, I forgive you. And then usually what they do is this is what you must do to be forgiven, say yeah. five Hail Marys and drink four Hello Dollies or whatever that's about, you know. Um, it doesn't say that. Give we have one church. mediator. Yeah, yeah, give to the church. Here's some <laughs> indulgences I'll sell you. That's not the modern Catholic right. Church, but that's the old right. Catholic yeah. Church. So. That's why it's in there, and I think Protestants should do more of it. Yep, absolutely. No, I think that that's where I've seen the biggest shift in my personal discipleship journey was when I finally had a group of men that I could count on to be able to go to with those places. And like you said, having a group of dude that also come to you with that because there have been so many times in my life where – I'll have a brother come and confess or, or say, um, share something they're struggling with in their walk or in their life. And then all of a sudden it's like, 
man, you know what? Yeah, me too. Me too. And, uh, and I think that that's key and that's where you start to see that unity really, really start to grow in that space. So, you know, I, I don't, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, uh, true friendship and I'm paraphrasing here, but, um, he said, true friendship, uh, begins at the moment when one person says to another, what you too, <laughs> I thought I was the only one. Yeah. And, and, and that's what we mean that's about good. the intimacy piece. Yeah. That's so good. I love that. Well, I think we've made it. Did we make it to the end of this one? Boy, we only covered. <laughs> Dude, we got. We five. got like five verses yeah. in there. <laughs> That's all right. That's why it's the that pillar. Way. Four. Yeah. But hey, let's be honest. This is a re- representation of Fight Club. That's a pretty good chunk for Fight Club. That's right. If you're going a chapter at a time, you ain't doing yeah. it right. No, Hope came home the other night. She was pumped. She, her Tab Women's Group uh, started a First Timothy uh, study and yeah. uh, they got seven verses done. Perfect. I didn't have the heart to tell that me and my high school boys only got through verses one and two, <laughs> but seven was good. That's awesome. So she man. was pumped though. She's at, I've never seen her more excited after coming out of a Bible That's study. Awesome. So like, we talked about this one word. So one it's word. Cool. That's good. Yeah, I love I love Fight Club. I'm learning that. It seems like every time I don't know if this is true for you. Maybe maybe somebody listening will hear this. Well, every time I'm in one, I love it. But on Mondays, right before, I never want to go. I lead it and that's, it's like, oh, I got to go to a fight club. Yep. And then I get there and when I leave, it's, it's the best. Yeah. That's why I annoy, you know, I've annoyed decades yes. of fight club guys. Cause I'll show up on Thursday and I'll always be like, welcome to fight club. Best night of the week. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just, it's just, I'm going to go in with this positive perspective yep. because I share your perspective yes. and there, how many times, countless times guys will be like, you know, we get to the end and we'll say, Hey, um, how does this affect your life? Yeah. And and then some guy will be like, I didn't even want to come tonight. Yep. And that just hit me right between the eyes. Yeah. That's every time with these high school. That's boys. our flesh, man. Yeah. Our flesh. That's that's that little sin part yep. that just wants a little me time. Yep. That is like I'm too busy. I've got better things to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure students can say that about Foundry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure students or you know young adults can say that about Sunday night. Ah, yeah. oh, do I really want to go? I just went to church this morning. I went to church. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And no, then once you're you. there, you're glad you went there yep. and you're walking. But I needed to say I needed to know if I was the only one that's like, nope, I do not. Even starting a new fight club, it's like, man. oh man. And then it starts. I'm like, man, this is awesome. I'm so yeah. glad I'm doing this. It brings so much just like I'm levity. Growing. I'm watching guys grow yep. and it's relational. I'm pumped too because at Man Up this weekend, I'll have a couple of my like high school dudes that are in my fight club. And it's like, we're not They're going coming. to this as foundry. We're not going to this as students. men. Yeah. Ooh, I'm some, fired up about that. some fellow men coming with me. So it's exciting. So Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think with the way we introed, uh, no free shout out, Skylar Bibles. Uh, you guys just released an NLT and John and I both really need one uh, just in case we need to take it with us somewhere. So I'd love a new Skylar Bible. Mm, Skylar Bibles. Where are you at? Hope wants one too. Benji, do you want a Skylar Bible? Why? Don't shake your head no. You have no idea that you don't want one. I don't. You're just disagreeing for the sake of disagreeing. I just don't care. Mm, It's messed up, man. I think he needs a Skylar Bible. I'm going to get him one now with Adam's money. Uncle Bill. No. Uh, Yeah. I don't know what else. Episode 100 coming out soon. Let's make sure we're subscribing to the podcast. We're almost to 500 subscribers on YouTube. So if you're not subscribed on YouTube, even if you don't even know what YouTube is, call your granddaughter or your grandson. Please do that. Have them download it. Subscribe to the Tabernacle on YouTube. Why? Because it would make me and John feel good. Yeah, it would. We want to get over 500. Yeah. If you're here and you're like, man, I love the podcast. You know what the podcast would love? You you to subscribe. subscribe. (laughs) So don't just be a taker, be a giver. Be a giver. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I love it. So like, subscribe, uh, share these episodes. Episode 100 coming soon. Coming soon. I think this might come out after episode 100. We're not really sure what's going on. (laughs) It's whatever the executive producer and the producer decide. Absolutely. So till next time, Tab Family, this is John Benji and Britton signing off. Thank you.